So we've taken a look at some ways we can organize architectures into things that make them different, uh, like CISC and RISC, uh, fixed versus uh, dynamic um, or variable length uh, instructions. Now let's look at the organization of how we actually implement an architecture and what uh, opportunities we have there to improve things and make it faster. Before we dive into the details, I want to take a few moments to talk about the parameters we have to understand what in fact does make something faster, uh, what are the mechanics of how we actually kind of measure a unit of time of how a CPU acts, um, and then we'll build up from there. So a computer clock is a mechanism in the computer that actually sends a pulse out to all of the hardware in the computer that listens for the pulse. Uh, basically what it does is it sets a amount of time that is considered uh, the execution cycle, meaning within this amount of time, all components of whatever listens to that clock, we're gonna kinda stick to the CPU here, but there are other devices that might be listening to the clock, and there are actually other clocks at different speeds for things like buses and, and such, but we'll get more into that when we get into I.O. Right now I'm gonna concentrate on the CPU, I just want you to know that clock cycles exist outside the CPU as well. So basically the clock sets the amount of instructions that a CPU can, can achieve or the amount of cycles that a CPU can achieve within any given time frame, and usually we talk about this within a second. Now this is usually billions of things per second. So when you look at a modern CPU and you see it's a four gigahertz or a 4.4 gigahertz CPU, a 4.4 gigahertz CPU means that that CPU can have a clock cycle of 4 billion, 400 million cycles per second. Um, which is obviously quite a lot. But instructions, remember, take more than one step. So if we just think of this in a linear fashion um, and we take instructions that we were uh, breaking down from our last talks where we went from little man and then we moved them into real instructions and we used uh, you know, representations just like this one, uh, we can see here in this particular time we would take four cycles uh, to accomplish um, a single instruction. So first we have to actually take the value of the program counter and put it into the memory address register. Uh, then we have to get whatever's in the memory data register and move it to the instruction register. And by the way, this, this isn't likely to just take one cycle. Uh, we're going to come back to that in a moment. I'm going to come up to this in a moment, but let's just leave that alone for now. Uh, then we're going to take, uh, after we decode, the instruction register's operand here, um, which is the address, and put it into the memory address register. Then we're going to take the contents of the memory data register and move it to the accumulator. And once all this is done, we're ready to go on to the next, next instruction. Notice here, we've already taken a proactive step to save ourselves one whole cycle. We realize that incrementing the program counter can happen asynchronously. Once we've gone ahead and used the contents of the program counter to retrieve the instruction, once that's complete, we can actually increment the program counter. There's no reason to have to wait for it to happen over here, wasting another cycle. So the way this can be accomplished is if, say you design a little adder that basically just increments, or at least maybe it allows for other uh, changes to the program counter as well for branching, but for now we're just gonna worry about the incrementation part. <laughs> And if we wire that hardware in directly with the program counter, in addition to, say, uh, another uh, addition uh, ALU, then we can do this at the same time that we do something else. And that saves us a whole clock cycle. So instead of this instruction taking five, it now takes four. This model is one of the ways that we're going to continue to improve the amount of things that happen. But let's just talk with this model for a second. So if we use this imaginary circumstance and we said that all instructions took four cycles as they do in this diagram, but that's not the case, and we said we had a four, bill, uh, four gigahertz CPU, we would then have uh, effectively one billion instructions that we could accomplish per second, right? Because it takes four instruction cycles, or four clock cycles to 
uh, accomplish an instruction, and we had 4 billion clock cycles to work with, so we get 1 billion uh, instructions completed. Now, uh, we're going to see how we can kind of build up from here and do better and better, uh, but that's the basic idea kind of coming into this. What, what opportunities do we have to make this faster? So a little bit more on clock speed. We know now that uh, this cycle is the amount of time that we kind of say, you know, a CPU can do this number of discrete things per time unit, usually a second. So why that amount? Why not just make all 10 gigahertz clock cycles? Why four or why three? Why does clock speed vary per CPU? And you may have heard of something uh, called overclocking, which people might actually try to speed up the clock time of their CPU. Why, how can they do that? And, and what, what physics allow it to happen? Well, the answer is similar to what we discussed with a bus. So there's a amount of skew time, basically, that it takes for all of the information to move from one part of the CPU to another. Um, so say you had two registers, register A and register B, and you want to copy the contents of register A into register B. There is a uh, short but measurable amount of time it takes for the data to move pretty much at the speed of light between those two uh, registers and also for those gated latches we learned about to do their uh, magic and actually retain the bits. So we refer to that as settling down within the register um, so that the information is actually locked within that register. The clock speed can't be faster, similar to what we said with a bus, right? Like if you had a short line and a long line, we said that the skew time was the difference between them and that you couldn't act any faster than that longest line's time, right? Well, this is the same idea. The clock speed can't be any faster than the longest time it takes for something to get moved around per all the instructions in the CPU, unless, of course, that instruction is going to take multiple cycles. So generally speaking, you're going to take your longest single uh, clock cycle instruction and use however long that is to determine the clock speed. Now, of course, they have to bake a little bit more time in because there has to be, you know, a little bit of buffer. If, you know, you say it's going to take, you know, whatever it is, you know, five nanoseconds and then, um, you know, something takes six, you're going to have a very confused system. Um, it's likely going to crash. Uh, there could be no crash, but weird errors and bugs that you didn't expect because, say, it was trying to save the number five, right? So, you know, it's to use four bits, zero, one, zero, one and it didn't settle correctly on one of the bits and you ended up saving the number one because you got zero 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 one instead of zero one zero one so there you know un you're not going to be able to tell exactly what the repercussions are going to be if you mess with this so by default uh they usually give themselves a little bit of buffer time now this is why you can overclock right you can actually uh, say, all right, well, I know they built in a buffer there. I'm going to, to try to push the boundaries and I'm going to increase my clock speed. And anyone who, ever, who has ever done this knows that problems start occurring. Uh, you'll notice just weirdness, right? The, the computer might be running fine and then all of a sudden it's not. And then maybe it crashes or maybe it doesn't. Um, and if you try to overclock it far enough, It'll, it might not even boot because the amount of time it takes to uh, have the problem where it's head uh, will be decreased because you're, you've increased the chance of showing it. Um, now, if you increase cooling and do some other things, you might um, increase the amount you can overclock it because you've increased the efficiency at which it disperses the heat and that means that it's moving faster and all that. So that's a, a basic overview of what clock speed is and how we determine it. Um, it's important to know that some operations might take longer than one cycle, um, but we're just using here the longest time it takes a operation that takes one cycle. Uh, that's going to determine our clock speed. So we're going to have a whole topic on uh, memory and the organization of memory and how to speed it up. For right now, I want to point something out, though. When we looked at this, we said that uh, 
our first cycle here, we got what was in the program counter and put it into the memory address register. So remember at this point, uh, the control unit enables the lines between these. Uh, it turns on the control lines so that the memory address register is in a write mode and the program counter puts its information on the bus. The memory address register lets those bits settle down all within our first clock cycle. Now note, that's why all these things have to be separated into different clock cycles, right? Because on a different clock cycle, we might be moving information, say, from, from the instruction register to the memory address register, right? So then that information is on the bus and the memory address register has to settle down. So that's why all these things are in separate clock cycles. But if you remember when we brought this up, we said that, well, you know, we're going to write the program counter to the memory address register. We're going to then activate memory, which means that the information in memory will come down to the memory data register, but we completely left out of the conversation how long it takes for this to happen. Now, this has been improving over the years, but let's just throw an arbitrary number out for right now. Let's just say that this takes, and this might actually be very optimistic, but let's just say it takes 10 cycles if you're just getting one thing from memory between here and here because you have to actually wait for memory to do its job. It's not instantaneous. Remember, memory isn't even physically located on the CPU, right? We're going to talk about caching and things later, but for now, just assume everything's in the memory chip. So this is your longest piece of the puzzle by far, and it's something that we're going to spend a lot of time looking on uh, at. Now, what we're doing here today is optimizations that we can do to the CPU, um, and they are very important, but without operations to the memory, uh, we would be um, not anywhere near where we want to be. Um, it's only going to be once we tie these two optimizations together, the optimizations in the CPU and memory, that we're going to get good results. All right, so I want to start our first optimization, which actually kind of uh, sets the the table for other ones to come after it. So the first thing I want to talk about is this idea of actually separating out, uh, separating out our fetch and execution units. So if you remember all the way back to Little Man Computer, we discussed the little man who was effectively the control unit as this metaphorical man who ran around and moved things, right? Well, imagine that he has a second guy, he has an assistant. And instead of the little man having to go and get each instruction by looking at the program counter, going to the memory, uh, pulling out the information and putting it uh, in his head, which was effective, effectively the instruction register, let's imagine that he has an assistant who does that for him. And all he does is actually act on the thing on his head. So, uh, you know, if he has a, a load instruction in his head, he's going to go ahead and grab the information from memory, uh, and then put it into the accumulator. And while he's doing that, the assistant is going to be going ahead and fetching the next instruction so that as soon as he's done with what he's doing, he's going to file that into his head. So let's look at the diagram to see how this breaks down in the hardware. So what we do is we kind of draw this little bubble around uh, the instruction fetch unit and instruction decode units. These are the actual circuits that are carrying out those functions. And what this means is that the instruction fetch unit can go ahead and have separate its own separate lines to the, the memory bus and to the memory addressing unit so that it can uh, put in the memory address uh, into the memory address register, get back the data directly from memory without affecting what's going on here. And what it's going to do is it's going to actually keep a buffer of this information as it gets the instructions. And it's going to pass as it you know, needs to one instruction at a time into the decode unit so that the decode unit can separate the operand from the uh, opcodes, just like we discussed before, and then those will be executed separately. Now, what's important to know here is that we're not just going to go and um, just fetch one instruction at a time, because remember we said that it might take 10, 20, maybe more cycles between the time when we ask for something from memory and when we get it back. So if we just got one thing at a time, uh, that would be horrifically slow. We're going to talk more about how we enable this to happen with memory in the future, but for now, let's just imagine that memory is capable of doing it magically and then we'll fix the magic part later. Um, but instead, we're going to have the instruction fetch unit 
get many instructions in the same cycle. Uh, maybe it goes and it gets 100 instructions all at one time, and it's going to keep those in a buffer, and then that buffer will be decoded as it's used. So the way we do this, the way we get these instructions in parallel and then deal with them, is that it takes a little bit of a change in how we, we looked at the hardware. Instead of having a program counter, we're going to change the name of a program counter now to an instruction pointer because it more, uh, you know, it reflects more what we're actually doing, right? Because instead of just having this one number that we're going to go and use as an address to go get, we're instead going to have this buffer. So what we really want to do is point to the place in the buffer where we are currently, right? So that's this idea of an instruction pointer. The instruction pointer is going to hold the instruction of the current instruction being processed. Um, once we have this in place now, we can decode and give the information to the execute units as it's needed.